to this session um, with Strata Ventures and Colin Williams with Big State Properties. My name is Enid Lopez. I'm the marketing director for those of you who don't know me. Um, and today we're going to be talking short term rentals. Um, so Colin Williams has been with Strata Ventures for about three years now, and he has done several flips, has several B Airbnb or er, several um, buy and holds, and has now started doing Airbnbs. Um, so yeah, so he's going to teach you today how to dive into that market. And if you have any questions, um, we're going to ask those at the end of the session. Um, and for all those that don't know about Strata Ventures and would like to get to learn um, about who we are and what we do, I'm going to have the QR code on my screen. So you're more than welcome to scan that at any time. Um, we are a Houston based company. We're a real estate implementation company. Um, we also have expanded out to Dallas and San Antonio, and we are now at a national platform. So it's wherever you're at, wherever city, wherever state, we're here to help you in any way that we can. Um, and now, Colin Williams, if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and then dive right into the presentation. Awesome. Well, thank you, Enid. And uh, first of all, I wanted to say welcome to everybody who's on the webinar. And uh, we're going to be talking about a great topic tonight in terms of short term rentals. But um, before we, we jump into that topic, let me just give you a brief background about me and then we'll get into it. So I've been investing for about 10 years now, uh, started in the long-term rental space, uh, almost on accident, but uh, I was looking for something while I was working in corporate America and uh, stumbled across in real estate. And so I saw this was the way to uh, do something that I enjoyed. And so uh, started there in, in 2010 as a landlord while I was still in corporate America and then progress to now that I'm doing real estate full time. Uh, my journey went from being a landlord uh, in the long-term rental game to doing fix and flips, uh, as well as you know, some more buy and holds. And now uh, I'm in the short-term rental space, which is what we're gonna be talking about tonight. And um, the progression for me was just very natural in terms of how I went from where I started to where I am today and I'm currently growing my portfolio. So with that, uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Okay. All right, can you see my screen, Enid? Yes, I can. Awesome, okay. All right, well, great. So let's, let's get started and let's jump into this. So I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. Um, you'll have the opportunity to get this presentation uh, at the end. And if you wanna reach out to me, there are several ways to do so. I'm on uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, and um, my website is also listed on the bottom of this page as well. So uh, what are we going to do in terms of talking about short-term rentals and, you know, put a brief agenda together uh, in the time that we have, there's not enough to cover everything that we're going to, that you're going to need to know in order to get off the ground and, and get in this game and to scale. But I'm going to give you, you know, a flavor for what you're going to need to know in terms of getting started and, um, and getting going in this industry. But we're going to start off with a brief history and then progress from there. So uh, short-term rentals have been around for a long time. Um, you know, even back uh, when a little boy named Jesus was born, when Mary and Joseph's mother went to the inn, they didn't have any room. So they decided to rent their manger out to them. So it can be any space that can be rented. Uh, that's really, you know, what it, what it ends up being. But how did it get popularized? And how did it get to the point where we see it today? Well, um, in the 1950s, all the way up to the 90s, and even to today, uh, it started to be advertised in the newspapers. So you'd see classified ads for uh, vacation rental property, for long-term rentals, and then for short stays. Uh, and 
Then it became even more popular in the 90s when VRBO, Vacation Rental by Owner, went online and that became the first platform to go online to offer people the opportunity to search through vacation rental listings and to book directly with owners. So uh, owners who would list their properties on this platform and for guests who wanted to stay somewhere, they had the opportunity to search through multiple listings uh, at one time and being able to do so and book directly online. Then a year later came booking.com. Uh, this is an overseas platform based in the Netherlands and they're huge. Uh, they started off with booking uh, hotels and then they got into the short-term rental space as well. And then in 2005 came HomeAway, uh, another site that's very similar to VRBO in terms of the way it was set up, uh, but they were competing strictly on the short-term rental uh, market. And then in 2008 came the, uh, the big player that we know of today, Airbnb. And they turned the, the business model on its head because uh, they provided a very easy to use platform for people to not only uh, search for listings and book, but also to host as well. So uh, that's why people have gravitated to this platform and um, are still doing so today. I think there's on the order of over 150 million uh, listings on Airbnb at this time uh, and growing. So uh, this, that's been huge. And there are other players in the marketplace, not just what you see on the slide here, but for purposes of discussion, I just wanted to share with you just a, you know, a brief history of the progression of short-term rentals and where it's going. Um, what, so what really is a short-term rental? It's really you know, any type of furnished property that can be rented out for a period of time, typically less than 30 days. Now, there are some people who rent for longer than that, but depending on your local laws and regulations, you can get into then having your guests, if they're ex exceeding that uh, short stay time period, to be considered an actual tenant. And then the landlord tenant rules applies versus a guest and host relationship. And wherein you would actually have to have a lease um, stipulating exactly what uh, the responsibilities are for your tenant and for you as the landlord. So it's something to think about if you're looking to get into the space, if you're gonna allow long-term stays, what does that mean and how do you comply to the local uh, laws and regulations? All right, so let's move on to uh, the next thing in terms of how this industry has matured over time. And, and really the way it started um, was when folks had some extra space. And what I mean by that is if you either owned a home or if you were an apartment or if you had um, you know, space that can be rented out, whether it's a tree house or a recreational vehicle or something like that, you could then go ahead and rent that out. Then that progressed to full homes. So going from you know, renting out a room in your house or renting out the garage apartment to you know, renting out entire homes. And then progressing to urban listings. This is where uh, the apartments came into, into play. And folks who would uh, used to sublet, whether they were traveling a lot, they would then turn around and sublet their apartment, but weren't making as much money or weren't rate making any money. They were just covering the rent. So here they turned to the short-term rental market and then being able to rent out uh, either a room in their apartment if they had more than uh, a one bedroom or a studio or the entire apartment in some cases and making more money being able to cover their rent and and making a profit on top of that and then you you got to listings at scale when you see people who have multiple listings on the platforms who are actually running this as a business and now to today we're in the time of the professional host and what does this mean, really mean is that you, know, you have uh, mastered the art of short-term rentals and you're basically curating the guest experience from start to finish. And you have a team of folks who are helping you uh, as you scale. And you have multiple listings across several different platforms. So at this point, you are considered to be a professional host. So that's, where, that's what the progression is uh, today. 
we've gone from just individuals who are doing this to folks who have formed companies who are doing this. Um, we've got uh, folks like Stay Alfred and uh, Lyric um, and Sonder, just to name a few who have thousands of doors who are doing this at a very high level. Um, so if you want to go from one listing to several, you can, and that's the way to do it. So what are the types of properties that you can, you can uh, list on as a short-term rental? As I said before, um, it started from the natural progression from having an extra space, extra room uh, in your house to doing a whole house or then doing apartments in the case of the urban listings. Or if you had an RV um, or you know, anything that you wanted to rent out, there are castles that are listed on platforms, tree houses, um, people are hosting different types of experiences, so, for example, submarines, just to give you a flavor of the different types of um, structures that you can rent out in this space and still do well. So any structure that can hold one or more persons can be rented, so long as you're providing, you know, a great guest experience and the guest knows what to expect, then uh, you can certainly rent out your space. Now, the biggest thing here is what are the business models associated with short-term rentals? Now, I have three shown on the screen, but really there are four. But for purposes of this discussion, we're going to be centering on real estate. So I'm going to keep it to the three that are real estate related. Uh, so the first one here is you can own the asset, right? The second is leasing an asset, which is called rental arbitrage. And the third is just managing the asset. So let's dive in. So in terms of owning, and I'm not going to read all the bullet points on, on each of these slides here. You can actually look through yourself, but I'm just going to highlight a couple of them as we uh, go through uh, the webinar. Um, when you purchase a property or build a property, then you, know, you own and control the full uh, asset. Um, you can rent out all or part of that asset. Uh, curate the guest experience, and then you get all the benefits associated with that, uh, having the entire asset. Now, uh, the biggest thing here is you have a not high initial expense, uh, as well as a longer payback period, in addition to the maintenance cost. So you got to you know, understand the trade-offs between the pros and cons of owning an asset and getting that up and running. And then the second one here, leasing the asset, where you rent a property and then you turn around and you put it onto a short-term rental platform or your own website, uh, furnish it, and, and you operate it. Of course, this is a lower initial operating expense because you're not buying a property outright. Um, it has a shorter payback period and you can scale faster using this model. Uh, but depending on who actually owns the asset, that means that you have limited control over the guest experience and you don't get the benefits of owning the asset um, as listed here in terms of, you know, equity or depreciation. And then um, if you have uh, a bad experience with the person who owns the asset or the entity that owns the asset, then you may be subject to being kicked out um, or when your lease is up, then they're not renewal. So something to think about if you get into the space and you want to go rental arbitrage, you have to maintain great relationships with uh, the owner of the property. And the third um, that we're going to talk about today is managing the asset, which is really just operating. So you don't own the asset. You're not furnishing the asset or anything like that. Somebody's already done that, but they want somebody to basically be their professional host. And this is where you come into play. Very low barrier to entry here. You can definitely scale quickly. Uh, and essentially you can build a property management company just off of hosting. Um, you don't have any control over the asset here. However, um, you're, you as a professional property manager or professional host in this case, uh, you're curating the guest experience, you're responsible for screening the guests, making sure that everything is in order, um, working with the uh, cleaning team, working with the maintenance staff, if um, the person who owns the asset has a maintenance person, or if it's an apartment building, then you know, working with the maintenance at the apartment building to make sure everything is in order, uh, making sure in inventory is handled and all of that. 
So, uh, and guest communication. The biggest thing here is time. How much time do you have to, to put into this? In, in all of these, you have to give the time, but here is how much time do you have to devote to it, given the, um, the lower uh, payback that you would get. So typically for uh, somebody who's hosting, it's anywhere between 25 and 30% of the gross revenues that they can expect to make in terms of managing an asset. So there's something to think about, but you can definitely start here and get going and then um, go up in terms of uh, jumping into these other business models. So let's talk about platforms. And one of the things that uh, I hear people say a lot is, oh, you're that Airbnb guy, or yeah, you, you do Airbnb. So the business is actually short-term rentals. The platform is Airbnb. So um, what I want you to, to be conscious of is, is when you say Airbnb, think of that as, as the platform, right? Um, so similar to other platforms that you would get on like Expedia, or Priceline or some of these other platforms where you're doing a transaction and you're looking for a specific thing and at the end um, you pay for it and then you get that good or service the same way when you're talking about short-term rentals. So the business is, is short-term rentals. These are the platforms which you can list and there are far more platforms that I have on this slide. Um, but you know, these are some, these are some of the ones that you will see um, when you get out there. Airbnb by, by far being the most popular, but you have BRBO, HomeAway, Booking, Flipkey, and a few others. Um, you can book anywhere. Uh, and there are a lot more players getting into the space because they realize that this is the new way that people are going. They want a different experience than what they've been getting when they go to a hotel. And if they're traveling with groups especially, it tends to be much cheaper to go to an Airbnb as opposed to getting a hotel where um, say if you're traveling with a group of six and you got three hotel rooms for 150 bucks a night uh, and you're there for four nights, I mean, that can add up as opposed to you renting a house um, that can hold six or renting an apartment that can hold six for you know less than that or $150 a night for the entire apartment as opposed to $150 for three different um, hotel rooms. So just something to think about as you get into space, uh, it's very advantageous for the guest. It's also advantageous for the host. So that's our uh, platforms. And now we get into talking about systems. You cannot do this business and be successful in this business without having systems. So I'm going to walk through each one of these and I'm going to talk a little bit about them to give you a flavor of what's needed here. So let's start with marketing because marketing is really your bread and butter. There are several different ways to market your short term rental. Um, we've already talked about the platforms on the last slide. Uh, that's the primary way. And I suggest that if you want to get into the space, go ahead, create yourself a free Airbnb account right now and just start learning how to interface with the platform. Um, because when you put up a listing on there, then you get an instant boost by Airbnb because you're a new host and you have a new listing. Um, so you get pushed up front. So to start getting you bookings right away, which is a great thing. Um, however, there are other ways to market. You can also uh, market by putting your property on your own website. That's one way to do it. Or you also have to, you can also post it on social media with a link back to your listing on the platform of choice, whatever platform that you're using. Usually they, each platform will give you a web link and then you can go promote your short-term rental listing on these social media sites. You can do paid or unpaid advertising for your short-term rental listing. So something to think about in terms of marketing. You can also go in and then market on sites like Craigslist if you choose to, and if you're trying to just drive traffic. Um, the other thing is furnishing your um, your short-term rental. 
how are you going to furnish your short-term rental? This is one of the, the main things that you've got to consider. Uh, are you going to go ahead and do it yourself? Are you going to work with a designer to help you with that in terms of coming up with a scheme, um, a color scheme or a theme uh, for your short-term rental? Are you willing to run around to the different uh, stores? Uh, so we're here in Texas and Houston specifically. So I'm going to just throw out a couple names of some stores like Ashley Furniture or uh, Star Furniture or a place called The Dump where you can get uh, clearance deals or you can run around and, and get accessories from say Home Goods or Pure One or some of these other places. Um, so just something to think about as you're, you're furnishing your short-term rental. Um, if you're planning to get in this business and to scale, then you've got to have uh, um, sources. One of the suggestions I would give to you is to develop relationships with furniture wholesalers that are in your market, because then you can um, definitely uh, reach out to them whenever you need furniture and you can uh, use them to furnish your short-term rentals. The next item is cleaning and quality control. So you have to have a great cleaning team uh, to make sure that the guest experience is maintained from guest to guest. Because believe it or not, guests look for almost anything. And if you don't have the right uh, cleaning and quality control, then your guest experience is going to go down the hill and your reviews are gonna start to get bad and then people are not gonna to wanna to book your, your listing. So you've gotta maintain a certain level of cleanliness in your properties and not just um, the overall clean, I'm talking about making sure that you get the dust bunnies in the corners, the webs that are up in the corners of ceilings or that may be on the ceiling fans, baseboards, things that we may not even think about during our, our normal cleaning of our own homes but a guest may look at this and they will notice. So just make sure you have a good cleaning protocol and then check, you know, you have to inspect what you ex expect and either you or somebody on your team, once you get to scale, you can have um, quality assurance or, or local team uh, managers who can go around and then check those things for you. The other item that some people overlook in this business is maintenance. So you wanna make sure that you keep everything in tip top shape in terms of your maintenance. Now, if you're talking about a single family home, you wanna make sure you wanna check all your mechanicals and have a maintenance schedule for that. Uh, when you're talking about looking at your uh, AC, looking at your roof, looking at your foundation, looking at your plumbing, all of these things need to be um, looked at. Uh, within there, it's also your appliances, making sure that your appliances are, are up to snuff as they get used, then do you need to replace them? Do you need to get them serviced? Uh, if you have washer and dryer in the property, making sure that those are uh, maintained as well. Uh, and, and your guests will have adequate use of all of these amenities. And so they won't be calling you saying, hey, there's something that's, that's broken. Stay out ahead of that. Especially and small things like light bulbs are a big deal too. So you can ask your cleaning team as they go through and they clean your property ever so often is, hey, check, make sure uh, all the lights are working, uh, that if there are any light bulbs out, then they can then reach out to the maintenance team or reach out, reach out to you and you then reach out to the maintenance team in order to get those items replaced. The next is security, and this is a big one. It's security for the gas, but it's also security for your property. And one of the things that uh, you've got to make sure is you have a really good system in place. Um, whether it's having an alarm, having uh, cameras on the property, having uh, noise monitoring on the property to make sure that people aren't partying in the property so that you can keep uh, on top of what you need to in terms of your property. The next item is uh, inventory control. And what I mean by this is there are um, several items that you have that are consumables that you may have in your property. So for example, things like uh, body wash or shampoo or conditioner, hand soap, uh, dish soap. If you have a washer and dryer, then you may offer 
um, the pods or something like that. You may offer a certain number of pods or you may offer um, a laundry detergent and fabric softener. So all of these are consumables that need to be replaced ever so often. So either you or your quality control person as they're going through checking your properties, then you have to determine a replenishment schedule for that. Uh, and then making sure that the, the guest experience is maintained from guest to guest so that you don't want a guest coming in and then maybe they they want to use the uh, laundry, but then when they go to um, pick up the laundry detergent, then there's only enough in there for one load. And, and then they're calling you in the middle of the night saying, hey, I don't have any laundry detergent. What, you know, what happened here? Um, so something to think about in terms of uh, how, do you, how do you do inventory control. And you, wanna, you don't want to buy too much, but you don't want to have too little. The other thing here is extra sheets and towels. You should always have uh, extra sheets and towels for your guests, uh, just in case they need it. Um, whether or not uh, they use it is irrelevant, but if they need it, it should be on hand. So, and you should also have some in your owner's closet as well. So if your cleaning team comes in and a sheet or a towel cannot be cleaned, whether it's um, using bleach or another type of cleaner, if it can't be cleaned, then they'll need to discard that, but then you'll need to have a replacement on hand. So have at least three sets for the number of guests that, um, that you host. So say for example, uh, in one room I have a queen bed, well, I have three sets of sheets and pillowcases for that one queen bed. So I have one that's on the bed, I have one that's in the closet, uh, in, in the room, and then I have one in the owner's closet. So that way I'm not running out having to buy um, extra sheets and towel, each extra sheets and pillowcases for that, um, that room in case uh, something gets destroyed or can't be cleaned when the cleaning team finds it. The next item is pricing. And this is a big one. Uh, a lot of hosts don't get the maximum amount from their short-term rental because they keep their pricing the same throughout the year. And that's a no-no. Uh, you got to have some seasonality in, um, in travel. You're going you're gonna to see that. And so your pricing needs to be reflective of it as well. There may be special events that are happening in town. So in here in Houston, you know, we have a couple of big uh, conventions. So for example, the offshore technology conference is huge. And if you have a listing that's close to that, then um, you have to price accordingly because they're going to be people in town. We have a lot of sporting events that people travel to. We have one of the largest uh, medical centers in the world. So there's a lot of medical tourism. In addition to people coming here for treatments, there's also folks coming here for uh, short stays in terms of traveling nurses who may be in town for three months. So you got to have the pricing to be reflective of what's happening in your marketplace. Uh, one of the ways you can do this, you can do it manually by updating your pricing on a daily basis, looking at the competition in your area and uh, adjusting your pricing accordingly. Or you can then use a dynamic pricing engine, and there are a few of them out there that will do automatic pricing for you. And what they will do is they hook directly into the platform that you're using and they will change your pricing on a daily basis based on what they're seeing in the marketplace. Uh, I currently use Wheelhouse for my dynamic pricing engine. Guest relations, uh, this is a big one. Making sure that you respond to potential guests when they have an inquiry. Um, they say within 24 hours, but well, on the Airbnb platform, you want to respond almost right away. Now, this can get to be a little bit tricky when you have multiple listings and people are messaging you all hours of the day and night. Um, you know, you're, are you going to tape your phone uh, or your tablet to your hand? No, you're not going to do that. But there's ways to, uh, to make sure you maintain communications with your guests or potential guests through automation, which is the next thing that we're gonna talk about. Automation is huge, and it can relieve a lot of the time burden of interacting with your guest. 
I currently use a platform called Your Porter to help me with some of my automation, but it's also a channel manager as well. That means it can handle messaging across multiple platforms, which is a great thing because if you're listed on multiple platforms, you don't want to jump from one app to the other app to um, send messages out. Uh, that can get to be very tedious and time consuming. And before long, you will get to not to think this business is not fun. But when you can automate these things, put your automated messages for when you receive inquiries or when a guest actually books, you send them an automated message. Before they arrive, they get an automated message. Before they check out, they get an automated message. And you're just sitting back, just, you know, sipping coffee or having your tea and just enjoying life. Um, does that mean you're not going to be doing any work? Well, no. You're still going to be um, interacting with your guests. However, it's going to be uh, less frequent because you have gotten your automation down, uh, down pat. The next is accounting. Um, and this is something that uh, business owners tend to leave on the back burner. I've been guilty of it as well. Um, you want to make sure you're looking at what you're bringing in in terms of your revenues, you gotta understand your average daily rate. You gotta understand how much your expenses are for the items that we talked about. For example, maintenance, cleaning, inventory, um, so that you're running a profitable business. And in the end, it's gotta be a profitable business. And then being able to make changes when, uh, when you see the numbers. So do I need to lower my price a little bit in order to increase bookings? Do I need to do something with my quality control because my reviews um, are, are going down? And that is taking a direct hit on the revenues that are coming in, which then affects your accounting. So all plays together. Um, the next item is insurance. Uh, one thing to be aware of here is that normal insurance, whether it's a home insurance or apartment insurance, is not going to cover you when it comes to short-term rentals. So you have to get the appropriate insurance policy for your short-term rental. There are a number of insurance carriers out there that are doing short-term rentals now. Um, you just have to go out there and ask the question, hey, do you insure short-term rentals? And, uh, and get the right insurance for you. Uh, the last item is laundry uh, on here. Uh, if you have laundry on site, great. However, once you get to scale, you don't want to have your cleaners um, washing the linens on site. You can then uh, get a laundry service to come pick those items up. So either you're going to have a central place where all your cleaners are going to be taking uh, your linens, and then the laundry service is going to come and pick them up, and then you bring them back, and then your cleaners will then bring them back to the properties, or um, they'll come directly to the property itself and do a pickup. Especially if you're in an apartment building, you may have multiple listings that may be advantageous for you. Or if you're in a subdivision, you may have two or three properties uh, or more that you have in a particular subdivision. So something to think about as you grow your business. So um, that's it for systems. So I talked about automation earlier. Uh, messaging is one of those things that you can automate but you also want to uh, use other things to, to automate as well. Um, so for example, uh, when I get a booking, not only does my guest get a welcome message, but my cleaners get a message saying, hey, there's a new guest, here's their check, uh, checkout date and their checkout time, and the cleaners are notified when they need to go clean the property. Um, I already talked about dynamic pricing with Wheelhouse, but you also have Beyond Pricing and Price Labs that are two others. I don't use those two, but I put them on here just so you can see that there's more than one option. Uh, I use digital locks so that I don't have to be there to check the guests in. They get checked in, they get a, um, a code, they enter that code into the digital keypad on the lock, and they can let themselves into the property. Um, if they're having trouble with it and they contact me, I can open the door remotely. So once again, that's saving me a lot of time. I don't have to jump in my car, ride all over town. And here in Houston, you know, things can tend to be far apart. If we're in rush hour traffic trying to get somewhere, 
it can take a long time. So this is all part of the automation that I use. Uh, I use a Blink uh, camera system uh, that tells me when the guests showed up, when they're leaving, what's going on at the property. It also is part of the security system. So that tells me um, if a guest left on time, um, do I need to uh, do something about it if they haven't left on time? So on. I use the, uh, the point system from Minute that's inside the property. It provides me uh, a way to monitor noise, but it also monitors motion, temperature, pressure, humidity. So I can see uh, what's going on inside the property without having a camera inside the property. And when I say noise monitor, it's, it's not monitoring somebody's conversation. It's listening for decibel levels. So I have a threshold that's set. And if it goes above that and stays above that for about 10 to 15 minutes, I get a notification. That means somebody might be having a party and then I can reach out to the guests and say, hey, we've got a noise complaint, can you keep it down? You know, very simple. Um, you know, so these are just some of uh, the systems that I use. If you have your own website, then you've got to think about how are you going to accept payments from guests? Uh, so one of the things that you want to set up if you have your own website is to use um, a service called Stripe, or you can use PayPal. But Stripe can uh, accept credit card payments, and process those payments and then can go directly into your, your business uh, bank account. So you don't have to worry about meeting guests in the parking lot and exchanging uh, duffel bags full of cash because they're getting ready to check in. Uh, you don't need to do that. So automation is a beautiful thing. Um, the other thing I would say is you wanna make sure that you have a digital thermostat because um, when your guests aren't there, you don't want to have your AC running at 65 degrees. So you can then uh, turn up the AC in order to reduce your operating costs, which again goes back to your profitability in terms of running this business, uh, making sure that um, you're taking care of what you need to take care of by monitoring your assets. Okay, uh, and that's it for automation. So as far as getting started, uh, I give you a little bit of about what you need in terms of systems and a little bit about each of those systems, but getting educated is the biggest thing. Now you can get on airbnb.com, create a free account. I would suggest you get started with this platform. If you choose another platform, that's fine. Um, just Airbnb just happens to be the largest and their app is very user friendly. Now, um, when you also do that, there's tons of articles on their website about how to host. You can get into Facebook groups as well, because uh, there are tons of face Facebook groups on short-term rentals. And then just start reading some of the comments, learn from folks' experiences to figure out uh, some of the things that you could then do to improve your short-term rental business. Choose a business model. Where do you want to start? Do you want to start uh, rental arbitrage, you have a property right now that you want to rent out, even if you want to rent out a room, if you have a vacation rental property, you have an extra property and say, hey, that's not making me any money right now. How can I monetize this asset? You can choose to do that. Or you can start with being a, a co-host and finding um, those who may have a property and want to get into the space, but they don't want to manage it. And then you do research. You can create a free account on AirDNA dot co airdna.co dot co so this company is a data broker and they have uh, hooks right into airbnb's data so on a daily basis they're pulling data on millions of listings and they're able to give you very granular data they have a, the free tier is is good so you can do some market research but the paid tier is even better the only thing with the paid tier is that they um they they sell you the data by zip code so if you want to find out what's going on in a particular zip code you can buy that information you can have it for a month you can drill down to each specific listing in that zip code find out how much that owner is making what's their average daily rate uh, what's their uh their booking percentage how many um, people do they have uh, staying there 
meaning that uh, how many people does, does, does their listing say it can hold. So you can get very granular in the research in comparing um, what you would like to do. So say for example, if you have a property and you think it can hold six or eight people, you do a filter on AJNA for uh, other properties in that zip code that hold up to eight people. You can then look at the li different listings. Then you can go on Airbnb and say, okay, let me pull this listing up, see what the pictures look like. Okay, uh, how, how am I com gonna compete with these people if I come into this market in the zip code? So this will help you be a better host. It will also help you to get in uh, a lot faster than if you didn't do this market research because you could either price yourself out of the market or you could put a price so low that you're not getting the right uh, guests coming to your property. The next is to locate a property if you don't already have one and then uh, launch on a single platform. So local locating a property, um, now if you're trying to go into arbitrage, then you can work with a real estate agent and tell them what you're trying to do and then they can go out and do some research for you with either an apartment complex um, or look for different landlords if you're looking to get a single family property they can broach the topic uh, with these individuals of course if you have a, a realtor that understands the business model and is able to explain it to to a landlord then great if not then you'll have to educate this person who's going to be representing and speaking on your behalf next launching on a single platform i suggested before airbnb but by uh, no means that that means that you shouldn't look at the other platforms. Go take a look, decide for yourself on which one you want to get on. But learn that platform before you get on it. Um, there are tons of videos out there on how to use each specific platform, what are the uh, best practices uh, on that platform, and how you can maximize your listing on a, on a specific platform. And then build out your systems, uh, which we talked about earlier. Uh, get those built out, write them down in terms of how you're going to be operating going forward, tweak them as you need to. And then uh, the next step is scaling. Once you get your first listing up and running on a platform, then the next thing to do is to scale. Go out and get more because that's where uh, it starts snowballing and you get um, real economies of scale once you get more than one listing then you can start actually hiring your own cleaning staff instead of using a, a cleaning service. Um, you can have your own maintenance person uh, on retainer if you choose to, or if you're in an apartment building or multiple apartment buildings and you have direct access to, access to the maintenance staff because you have multiple listings and they wanna maintain that relationship with you as a business owner. So, uh, that's it in terms of what I wanted to share uh, tonight. And the next couple of things I want to do is to just show you a couple pictures about my, uh, my listing. So here, this is uh, my most recent listing, uh, which is the one that I'm in right now uh, doing this webinar. And so um, we just launched uh, last month. And so uh, this has been, been doing very well so far. And we will continue to tweak this, uh, this listing going forward. And then uh, here's my first uh, listing. So this one is going uh, very well also. And uh, we had a couple of issues just recently, um, but those have been taken care of. And this all comes down to having those systems in place. So with that, um, I will entertain some questions. Beautiful properties, by the way, Colin. They're Thank you. absolutely amazing. Um, yes, yeah, so we do have several questions. Um, so we're just going to dive into those. Um, so we have, um, so how do you find the market value on an Airbnb? How do you find and structure that? Okay. So there are a couple ways to, to do this, right? If you... Um, are looking at a property and want to know, hey, does this make up a, a good Airbnb or good short-term rental, then you've got to do your research. So you can create a free account on the Airbnb platform. And as a guest, you can go search in that specific area. Say, okay, so uh, we're here in Houston, Texas. 
say that one of the towns is Missouri City, you can say, okay, I want to travel to Missouri City. I have four guests and I want to stay and pick a couple of dates. Uh, and then look at all the properties that are in that area. See what the, they're charging for the, the dates and times you want to stay and say, okay, are there a lot of listings here? If there are, uh, then you can look into each listing. You can click into their calendars and you can see, hey, uh, does this, this person have um, occupancy? How many uh, days of their month are actually booked? Now, it's, it's tedious to do this, to go into each listing. That's why I recommend going into AirDNA because then you can see the data in aggregate. Uh, it gives you graphs uh, and then you can look at each of the graphs and you can say, okay, um, so I'm looking at a property that's a three bedroom, two bath uh, in this specific zip code uh, and I think it's gonna hold uh, 10 guests. Okay, then what is that going for in that specific zip code? And it will give you a seasonality graph that tells you what's the average daily rate, how much you can expect to make on an annual basis if you are doing business in the specific zip code. Nice, great information. Uh, so the next question is, if you have a timeshare, can you Airbnb it? That's a great question. Um, and I would say that you should look at the specific rules of the timeshare company to determine whether or not you can turn around and, and do short-term rental in that uh, timeshare. Uh, they're probably very restrictive. So I would suggest you definitely um, read the rules first before going ahead and doing it because you may find yourself getting shut down uh, and maybe even kicked out of that timeshare and then you may have lost all the money that you put in. So just be careful of that. Nice. Okay. Um, next question is, how do you know it's a good area? Um, let's say you, you're not too familiar with the area um, and you don't know like crime wise or all that. Obviously, um, you want to do your due diligence and check that out. But like, how do you just know it's a good area for Airbnb? Okay. Well, this is, a, this is another great question. So first, um, let's think about it from the investing side. Uh, some of the things that we currently do when we look at a specific area, whether or not we want to invest and buy a property in that area, does that make sense? So we look at uh, different things when we pull reports from HAR. So we look at um, the employment numbers. Uh, we look at the school district. Uh, we look at um, married versus single, uh, and you know those those are just a few of the the statistics that we look at. You can use some of the same statistics to determine whether or not it's a good area. Uh, so, if it is, and if the rating in um, in your MLS, your local MLS, wherever that is, is is good, then it's a good area to invest in general. Then you would go do your research on these other platforms as I talked about and see if it makes a good for a good short-term rental. Because if it makes for a good investment, either as a fix and flip or regular rental, then it may also make sense as a good short-term rental. The issue you need to be aware of here is if you're going into a subdivision, they may not allow short-term rentals. So don't go buy a property thinking you're gonna do short-term rentals only to find out that the HOA does not allow that. So you would want to find out those um, um, covenants, get them uh, ahead of time just to see. Uh, now, the other way you can do that without getting the covenants is by going on airdna.co or if you go on airbnb.com and then search in that particular area to see if there are any current listings. Now, that doesn't mean to say that an HOA may not have rules against short-term rentals. It means that somebody uh, may be flouting those rules. They may be operating uh, against those rules and they could be shut down at any time. So um, just be aware of that. And if you decide to take that risk, just understand the consequences if uh, you get caught. Great. Um, and so do you suggest for short-term rentals um, in area-wise, maybe by hospitals, by airports, um, location-wise, you would you rather 
um, may not be a good investment opportunity, but you know, exit strategy is key. So you would have to look at it several different ways. And would you say that maybe some of those areas would be more high end to the short term rental aspect? Uh, yes, I would. I would say definitely um, near near an airport, uh, near a medical center, near convention centers uh, are great locations because you get a lot of people who are traveling. So if you're going to cater to the traveler, then that's awesome. Um, you know, you just have those amenities that a traveler would be looking for. So for example, uh, in this listing, I have a desk, I have a monitor. I have a place where they can plug their computer in and get some work done if they want to do that. Now, Airbnb um, actually requires that. So you got to make sure you have a business friendly listing. So if somebody wants to come and work and they can do that. Um, now, you don't have to have if you if your place holds like eight or 10 guests, that doesn't mean you have to have eight or 10 desks. One desk is good enough. Um, not everybody who's, who's traveling is going to be working in that capacity, but you offer the option in case somebody uh, wants to use that as an amenity. Um, so, yeah, uh, I would say those areas are great areas to, to focus on, but understand there's a competitive landscape as well. So when you're doing your research, look at uh, how many other folks who are listing in that specific area before you jump in. Nice, great information. Um, and I know you just touched on it briefly. Um, does the HOA get involved in a short-term rental? Yeah, they, they can. They can shut you down. Um, so, you know, just, just beware. Uh, they may not have rules. If an, an HOA may not have rules, but if your neighbor complains because uh, you're not running your business as well as you should, and, you know, they're complaining about noise and you're not really doing anything about it, then uh, they can complain to the HOA and then they can then turn around and shut you down. So just something to be aware of. Nice, okay. Um, so we have a question about furnishings. So I know you discussed about, um, you know, the, the dump or the local furniture stores um, or a designer to help you stage the property. What do you think about stagers? I think stagers are great because if you don't have that eye yourself to go in and uh, pick out furniture that pull a space together, uh, for example, um, if you have a, a, a large house and then you go in and you get this tiny IKEA furniture, then that's not going to look right in that space. Yeah, so I mean, you may have furnished it very inexpensively, but when people come in, they're going to be looking around as like, you know, what happened? I mean, you know, it, it's this is not going to work. So just be aware of that, that um, a designer or a stager can help you in terms of finding furniture that fills the space appropriately so that um, a guest coming in will feel like, oh, okay, this is the way this is supposed to be as opposed to coming in, looking around, and they can't quite put their finger on it, but they know something's wrong. You know, if all the chairs are really small and they're like, okay, well, I don't know what's going on here, but you know, we're not in kindergarten and uh, I'm a grown person, so I can't sit on that chair over there because it's just too small. So um, something to think about there. The other thing is the time factor. How much time do you want to spend running around town trying to figure out if um, this throw pillow matches your uh, your couch, right? Or, hey, are these the right uh, curtains that I need to get for this space? So just, you know, leave that to a professional if that's not something that's in your wheelhouse, it's not your forte, uh, leave that to the professional. They can do it much better. And uh, for my first property, I used a stager and she was awesome. So she saw things that I didn't see and was able to help me to design the space that's comfortable and inviting. Great. Um, and, you know, if you're starting out as a short-term rental and you don't have the funds, to the time to go out and buy piece by piece, you can pay them to come in and have that until you're able to get to that, that level. Absolutely. Okay. So they, um, they, next question. They, one quick comment on that. They also have relationships with um with folks so they can get furniture wholesale 
So, you know, that's something that, you know, if you don't have that relationship already, just, um, you know, work with a stager, a designer who has those uh, wholesale furniture relationships, they can get furniture for you at, at uh, discount rates. Awesome, great information. Um, okay, so for as the screening process, um, do, do you consider maybe um, outsourcing to a property manager um, as far as keeping up with the property every month and who's coming in and out? So if you own a property, you've already furnished it, but you don't want the hassle of operating it, then you can um, have somebody operate it for you. They're called co-host. So, and then they get a, a cut of the, the gross revenue that comes in. Um, <clears throat> I would say, yes, there are a lot of people who are doing co-hosting and they're doing it at a professional level. So if you're not comfortable, or if you want to turn that over because your time is valuable and you want to be doing something else, then absolutely. Yes, you can turn it over. Um, but I would say here is that you learn how to do this as well, because how are you going to then direct somebody if you don't know what they're supposed to be doing. So once again, going back to inspecting what you expect. So learn about what, what um, the host, the co-host would need to do in order for you as the owner uh, of the business, because each unit is a business. And so um, don't just turn it over to them thinking that they're going to be running it in your best interest. Uh, just make sure that you inspect what you expect. Right. Okay. So for the next question, um, do you find things are working differently with COVID-19 or have you seen any changes? That's a great question. So um, COVID-19 did uh, shake up the short-term rental space quite a bit. So uh, I'm just going to talk about the United States here in terms of what happened and Airbnb specifically. So uh, back in March, we started the lockdowns across the country and in different cities, different states started doing lockdowns. And Airbnb decided to um, make some changes in their wisdom without uh, letting hosts know. What they did was they said anybody who was traveling and was going to cancel their reservation uh, despite what a host cancellation policy may be, they would get 100% of their money back. So they were actively encouraging uh, guests to cancel the reservation. They were actively encouraging hosts to cancel the reservation. Now, if a host canceled, the host did not get anything. Didn't get anything. So um, if the guests canceled and they canceled even within your cancellation period where uh, a certain percentage of the funds would have gone to the host. So say for example, if I'm on a strict cancellation policy and somebody cancels within 14 days, then I keep 50%, the guest gets back 50%. Um, if it's within side seven days, then I get 100%. So, you know, in this case, I was getting nothing. So, uh, as a result, over $4,000 of my bookings vanished overnight. That was just from one listing. So you could imagine if somebody has multiple listings, I mean, this is, you know, thousands of dollars. In some cases, um, uh, for, for one person, it was, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars just going up in smoke overnight um, because of their cancellation policy changes. Now, um, they 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 did that and then there was a backlash from host and then uh, they came up with a fund uh to see if they can they can um you know help the host out in a way so they said hey you know what we will give you um some money back uh, we'll help you out you know we know that this is tough uh, for everybody and so they uh, created a 250 million dollar fund to help folks out so that, that was one of the things that happened. Um, so then later on, fast forward a couple of months, people then started traveling a little bit more uh, again uh, as things started to open up. Um, so we're talking about, you know, June timeframe, uh, even May, late May, late May um, or mid-May, people really started traveling again. 
uh, a lot of people started traveling in state. So instead of seeing a lot of out of state travelers, you would see people doing staycations instead. You know, folks wanted to um, do parties. So this was the rise of the party people, as I like to call them. Uh, and that's where you've got to be strict in terms of who you let into your property. Uh, so, you know, COVID did do quite a bit in terms of the shakeup of the short term rental market, but the market is still strong uh, and still going well. Some um, jurisdictions decided to outlaw short term rentals for a period of time during COVID. I don't know why, because that doesn't make sense. Um, if you needed to, if you were tested positive and you needed to stay away from your family for a couple of weeks, where would you go? You know, if you didn't have the option, um, you could just go to a short term rental and stay there for a couple of weeks uh, while you wait it out. You know, um, if you were a first responder and didn't want to go home to your family, then you can go to a short term rental. You know, so these were things that um, local leaders were not thinking about when they decided to shut down short term rentals in, say, Philadelphia and I think certain parts of Florida. They shut it down um, when, in fact, that, you know, that shouldn't be the case. I, I understand why they did. And I think it was because of the rise of the party people, people who were using short term rentals to go party and then uh, spreading the virus because they didn't believe that it was uh, real. Yeah. Yeah, and we couldn't go out to restaurants or water parks or, you know, any en other entertainment facilities. So they just came together uh, right. and potentially could spread it that way. So, yeah. Um, okay, so next question is, is, so if you have a property that isn't moving, should you consider turning it over into a short rental? You could, yes, absolutely. Um, I would say definitely do the homework to see if that makes sense. Um, you could partner with folks to do this as well. You don't have to do it on your own. So say, for example, if you have a property and you want um, somebody to come in and furnish it, and then you can do, uh, do the 50-50 split, then, you know, great. Um, I would say that's a definite option depending on where the property is and what's going on in that neighborhood. Um, okay, so as far as rules being in place, um, let's say some of those party goers broke something or accidentally, you know, um, placed something in their bag. For lost or item or broken stolen or lost, broken, or stolen items, what is your system in place for that? Okay, great question. So one of the, the first piece of the system is to take pictures, right? So take pictures of your property, not just for your listing. Um, we take pictures after every cleaning, before and after every cleaning. Why do we do that? Because it's documenting the state of the property. So um, then we go through and then we check. Hey, is something missing? Is it something broken? Um, and then we document that. Right, so we do the before shot showing, hey, here are what the cupboards look like. Here are you know, what the pictures look like. Here's what the, the, the TVs look like before this person checked in. Here's what they look like after they left. So this way we can show a clear difference between um, the way it was before and after. And then we also have receipts for everything we purchased. We have digital receipts, so we scan everything and we have it available to us. Um, and then when we make a claim, so here's the best thing with Airbnb. This is why I suggest you, know, you get on this platform first. Airbnb has a million dollar host guarantee. What does that mean? Does that mean you get a million dollars of uh, teacup gets broken? Well, no. <laughs> That means you can get up to a million dollars if you can prove your case and the items that you're um, claiming is worth up to a million dollars. So that means don't go out and get a property that's worth two million because you're not going to be able to recover. <laughs> um, the other thing is uh, the evidence that you provide and it's not only just it's the pictures, the receipts, and then your description of exactly the damage. You want to keep emotion out of it. 
just stick to the facts. Hey, here's, uh, here's the guest. They checked in on this date. They, um, they left on this date and these items were here. Um, see picture A as reference. And when they left, uh, here's picture B as reference. These items were missing. You know, don't go in and get all emotional and say, oh, you know, this guest stole or this guest broke or no. Just stick to the facts and that's it. And um, typically, Airbnb will um, honor your claim. Um, in some cases, they may not. Uh, I recently had a claim for $1,500 worth of damage to one of the properties and the guest paid it. So I did not have to call Airbnb for the host guarantee. The, um, the guest actually paid it. And I had another claim for almost $500. The guest declined it. Uh, and Airbnb did pay out some money. They didn't pay the whole amount, but they did pay out uh, some money, which was great. So, um, and, and the guests know, they knew they broke these items. They knew it because they even admitted it. Uh, but they refuse to pay. So just know that this is something that you're going to run into um, and proper documentation is key. Would you consider, you know, having like a sign saying lost or broken remote is, you know, a hundred dollars or yeah, broken window? Yeah. You know, having signs and we're like in a hotel, you know, they, they have that, that, that signage, those fees. Would you consider having something like that available? Absolutely. And that, that's a great suggestion. And I actually have that in my house rules. Uh, I have uh, for lost or stolen remotes is $100 for garage uh, door openers for keys, you know, all of those those types of things. I have uh, fees associated with that smoking. There's a fee, $200 a day fee for smoking. Um, because you have to then bring in a odor remediation company to come take care of that. Um, that's a cost to you as a business owner. So, um, you know, just say it up front. And yes, you can have signage in the property because what, what you find is that not everybody's going to read your house rules, yeah. even though um, they have to acknowledge it on the platform. They're not going to read everything. They're just going off of pictures. Oh, man, this looks like an awesome place to stay and party. All right, let's, let's do it. I also have a, a, a clause in, in my house rule saying no parties and no events. I can't tell you how many people reached out to me saying, hey, we've got a sweet 16 or we've got this or we've got that. And I'm like, well, you know, here, here are my house rules. So I have a template set up and I just hit the template button, populates the message, here are my house rules. Um, as you can see, we don't do parties or events. Um, you know, can you make an exception and say, yes, we can make an exception during these times. Uh, and then you can limit the number of guests. You can say, okay, well, because of social distancing, you know, we're only allowing 10 people. We're only allowing this. You set the rules as the business owner. And if the guests um, decide that no, that's too restrictive, we don't want to deal with that. One guest was asking me about placing a sign outside in the yard because you see, you've seen that might be uh, popular because of COVID. People aren't having parties anymore. So they put, you know, happy birthday, you know, signs outside in the front yard. Uh, I'm like, no, you know, you just, we're not allowing signage in the front yard. You can have something inside, but not outside. So um, you set all the policies, you know, have stuff in your house rules, but that's also a great suggestion to print stuff out once they get into the property. Um, have your Wi-Fi password as well, you know, maybe printed somewhere inside the property so they're not harassing you at two in the morning after they check in wanting to know what the Wi-Fi password is. Great. And so actually that was my next question was, do you have a limit on the number of guests? So let's say like each room, do you do like in each room is a, maybe a different stay or um, uh, is the whole house can be rented? Um, what's what's yeah. the criteria? Like, so, so another great question, uh, you as a business owner can decide how you want to run that business. Um, you can rent out by the room. So if you have a, a four bedroom house, you can rent out by the room. Absolutely. However, just realize the logistics around that, right? So you have to have a lock on every single door, bedroom door, right? Um, 
And people have to be comfortable coming into a space that they're going to be sharing with strangers. Now, this is, we're in the sharing economy. So, uh, you know, people jump into cabs together, they jump into Ubers together, no big deal. Um, but usually these are groups who, who know each other, right, who are getting into these spaces. So when you have, uh, hey, I have a room for rent over here, they're getting into a space where somebody they don't know. Um, you have the potential to make more money by renting out by the room, but your operating cost is going to be a little bit higher because people are going to be checking in and checking out at different times. So you're going to have your cleaning team running in there every other day to clean just a room, uh, as well as the common rooms. If there are people staying there while the cleaners are there, that can be an issue, especially now. Um, so I would not encourage folks to rent by the room at this time, rent the whole house. This way, People check in and when they check out, the cleaners can come and clean and you don't have to worry about socially distancing because you know somebody's on a couch in their robe watching TV because he's in room six where the other person just checked out in room two and they're like looking at your cleaner like, why are you here? You know, uh, so yeah, just, you know, you don't want to make people uncomfortable in, in this type of environment. So uh, I prefer to rent out by the whole house, but I know there are other people who, who rent out by the room. Uh, and then some people do both. They'll rent out the whole house during the, um, the most popular times of year. And when we get to what's called the shoulder season or the slow season, then they'll rent out by the room. So they can maintain that profitability. Of course, going through all the other things that I just mentioned and what, it, what you need to do when you're renting by the room. So um, if you're renting out by the house, what's your guest limit? Okay. Like Good, per yes. room or per... Right. So it's per house. So it's, it's really about beds, right? Mm -hmm. So beds, that's, that's the biggest thing. So um, two people yeah. in a bed. So that's the, the count unless it's, um, unless it's like a, uh, a twin bed. You know, even a twin bed, you can still fit two kids, right? Um, so for me, so say a four-bedroom house, I'll do 12. So I have um, four beds, right? That's, that's eight. And then I have um, either an um, air mattress, right? That's where Airbnb started, by the way. They started doing with air mattresses. That's where the air comes from, air bed and breakfast, believe nice. it or not. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you, right. So you can have an air mattress or I have convertible, um, sofas. So I have a queen and I have a full in this particular listing. So I can sleep a total of 12. Now, if I put uh, an air mattress in here, I can sleep 14, a queen air mattress. I can sleep 14. You know, sometimes you can get those, uh, roll away beds. Um, and if you have a closet that's big enough to, to put, something like that in and say you have two, then you can get another couple people in and that's 16. Um, so the more heads in beds that you can get, the better. And that's the biggest thing, the more heads in beds. Nice. Okay, and the last question that we have is what is the criteria to get started as a host? Like do, is there some kind of you have to have some credentials in place? Do you have to have like a cert certification? Do you have to go through a process? Like, how does that get started? No, you, you don't have to have anything um, set up uh, to start this business. But what I would suggest is that you do not host um, or you do not own property in your own name. Uh, so if whether you're doing rental arbitrage or whether you own a property to do it in an LLC, if you're managing, do it in an LLC because one, that makes you more professional and two, there are certain write-offs associated with your business. Um, you don't have to have any credentials. There's no uh, course for how to do this. Well, there are lots of people who are selling courses out there. Um, some good, some not. Uh, it's up to you as the individual to go out and get the education. Um, one of the things I would say is that you can work with somebody who is an existing host who was already doing this to, you know, to learn the ropes. Uh, so either you provide some set sweat equity or something and say, Hey, you know, I'll do this for you, you know, so I can learn the ropes or whatever. 
Um, that way you can get in, uh, understand what you need to do, learn quickly, and then go take action. I have a question. What if you're a leasee and you want to rent out a room? How does that process work? Okay. So if you're, if you're um, leasing a property right now and you want to rent out a room, you got to talk to your landlord and say, hey, you know, um, I'd like to do this. Is this okay with you? Uh, and then if it is, then you sign a, um, put a one sheet amendment to the lease agreement together that gives you the approval from the landlord to do it. Awesome. Well, I think that's all the questions that we have came across for now. Um, is there anything else that you wanted to add to before we end the, the meeting? So I, I would say for folks out there who are watching this, um, that if you want to get into this space, this space is still growing. Uh, it is not saturated by any means. Uh, there's still opportunity in the space. One of the, the things that I did not talk about as far as the business models are concerned, because it's not real estate related, but it's more sharing economy related, um, is that now Airbnb is starting to host what's called experiences. So uh, there are a couple people on there that are uh, doing different things. So say, for example, if you want to learn how to play the guitar, or if you want to learn how to do magic, or if you want to learn about wine tasting or how to um, uh, do plant clippings and how to, how to grow uh, plants from doing a clipping of a couple of other plants, you can go in and get these experiences. So they do, they do the same thing. They have these Zoom calls. So it's not live and in person. Um, and you can do these experiences. Uh, that's been very popular since COVID. Now, these experiences, think, I think, are going to grow and um, expand as people get into the space. And even after COVID, I think they're going to, to um, grow exponentially because then uh, you have a platform that's curating an experience for you. And then these experiences can, can then be in person. So if you wanna do a wine tasting, you sign up on Airbnb for this wine tasting, you go to this person's house or their um, place of business, they, they do the wine tasting for you, it's all done through the platform. So they're starting to realize that there's other stuff, not just real estate, that they can curate through their platform. That's the Airbnb experiences. So there are other, um, other places that are doing this stuff too. So as far as hosting, um, there are definitely a, a few resources that are out there that I mentioned earlier, airbnb.com, airdna.co. Uh, as well as on the automation slide to take a look at some of those companies um, that provide those types of uh, automation services for you. And when I say automation, what I mean is there's a digital, uh, there's an app associated with it. There's a device that's linked via uh, the internet, via your Wi-Fi at your property that um, then sends you notifications when things happen or you can control a device through the app, um, whether you're setting up things up on a schedule or if there's a trigger because of a certain um, threshold that is met. So that's what I mean by automation there and then you learning about that. So just, uh, just a couple of things to, to end the call with and um, hopefully folks can go out there and get started on their business. Yes, for sure. Well, we appreciate you taking the time out of your day to go over this information. I'm sure it's going to be very useful for those that are looking to dive into that area and are kind of uncertain on, you know, how to get started or what type of information to have in place. So we appreciate it. It was great information. Um, and, you know, good luck in, on, on all that you've got going on as well. Thank you. You're and uh, stay in touch. Yeah, for sure. And if everyone wants to find out about Stradaventures, I'm going to leave the QR code up. Um, and then you can scan that from your phone and it'll take you to all of our, our uh, social media sites and you can learn more about us. And there's going to be a, a link for you to um, click on and you can uh, click on that, fill out that information and we'll get back to you. Okay, well, everyone have a great day and Colin, you know, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Awesome. Thanks, right. Enid. Thank take you. Bye-bye.